I actually got rejected from Imperial, UCL and Birmingham in that order before my Oxford interview. I'm gonna confess to you guys that actually in second year, I was diagnosed. Hi everyone, we've just hit 3,000 subscribers and that is crazy. And that's all thanks to you guys. So thanks so much for being such an amazing supportive community. We really appreciate it. And we're just blown away by the incredible support that you guys give. So in this video, I'm gonna be giving you guys a definitive guide for how to apply to medicine, at either Oxford or Cambridge. We're gonna be going through everything. We're going to be going through why you should even apply to Oxbridge. We're going to be talking about stereotypes. Is everyone really posh? Is everyone just a genius? We're going to be going through all your questions and also giving you guys strategies and tactics to maximise your application from every step of the process, whether it be work experience, extra reading, personal statement, BMAT, interviews, when you get an offer, A-level revision, as well as what to do after in that summer between year 13 and university. So I'm going to be revealing all and telling you all my secrets. Here at the Aspiring Medics, we've helped thousands of students to get into medical school. So be sure to check out our one-to-one -one tutoring and our online courses to help you get into medical school. Link is in the description below. Okay, so a question that I get asked a lot is what is the traditional teaching style at Oxford? So for those who you may not know, Oxford Medical School, the teaching there is six years long. The first three years are pre-clinical, whereas the latter three years are clinical. So in the first three years, you're going to be learning all about the physiology, so how the body works. You're also going to be learning about pathology, how the body can go wrong, and based on what can go wrong, how can you correct those processes to get the patient to be better, to feel better. So that's what the first three years are going to be all about, and you're going to have that through seminars, you're going to have lectures, you're going to have practicals, as well as, of course, tutorials. We're going to be talking about tutorials a bit later on. So the first three years are essentially giving you the fundamentals of medical science. You're going to be understanding the physiology and the pathology. Whereas the latter three years, so from fourth to sixth years, that's where you're going to be actually in the hospital. That's where you're going to be applying your scientific knowledge. Now, that's quite different to other medical schools. At other medical schools, for example, you could actually be in hospitals from day one, from the first week. But for Oxford, it's very different. You have very limited clinical experience. You have some, but I need to stress, only some in the first three years. So that's the main difference between um, traditional teaching styles and say integrated that can combine all the way through. And when I was applying, I was like, well, I don't know if that's gonna be for me because I wanna be a clinician as a doctor. I don't want to be a researcher, but actually it means that you can still think like a scientist when you have a patient in front of you. And that's particularly useful. Whereas when I was doing my GP shadowing in first to second years, actually I wasn't really able to get much from it because I didn't really know much about the diseases. I didn't know about the different treatments. And so you didn't actually gain that appreciation. Whereas from fourth year and beyond, you almost get this payoff where everything kind of clicks, everything makes sense. You can find out more about different teaching styles in our videos. We created a whole new one where we go through all the different teaching styles and we compare them. So you can check it out, link is in the description below. Okay, the next question is all about tutorials. What are tutorials? So in Oxford, they're called tutorials. In Cambridge, they're called supervisions. They're exactly the same thing. Basically, tutorials are academic conversations that you have with a tutor, an expert in their field. And for me, they serve two purposes. One, it could either be to go over something that you didn't quite understand in lecture and that you didn't quite understand in your essay that you might have had a misconception about that they can go through. Or two, it might be actually, you know what, you understood something really, really well, in which case they could go through the extension stuff, whether it be looking at the clinical relevance, whether it be looking at experimental evidence. So to give you an example of that, if you're learning about vision and if you're, say, confident of understanding how that physiology works, then actually what they can then do is talk about the different diseases that can occur within the eye, whether it be glaucoma, whether it be colour blindness or other ways in which you can actually have partial or full blindness. I would definitely say that it's been the highlight of my medical school academic life, particularly because you can go through and sit down with these experts in their fields. And that's something that's super, super personalised and you really do feel like they care about you as a person because if you are struggling, you will not be struggling for very long. Another question I get asked is one, how to pick a college or is it true that X college is better than the others? The answer is there is no such thing as the best college to study medicine. All of them are genuinely fantastic. So colleges, as we've described, are those academic communities where you're going to be eating, sleeping, you're going to be having your tutorials in and you will be able to make friends for life. And that is by no exaggeration. Colleges will vary in terms of their size, in terms of their location, how central they are, either to libraries or to the medical school itself. So all of those little things, you know, those little styles, whether it's old, whether it's more modern, can vary. 
but don't read into student room a lot to say, oh, this college is more conservative, oh, oh, this college is more liberal. It's really not true, and a lot of that is just exaggeration. And ultimately, university, not only at Oxford, but anywhere else, is what you make of it. And you'll find people from all walks of life, from all sorts of diversities, and there's a phenomenal amount of different societies available, whether it be music, sports, drama, cultural, religious as well. So you can get involved in a huge amount. And specifically for me, it's been the African Caribbean Society, uh, the Oxford University Islamic Society, and of course, the Oxford University Powerlifting Society. I was the president the other year and I've absolutely loved it and I've loved competing. Big love to all those three societies. Um, I found my people, I guess. Whilst we're on the topic of tutorials, it's of course important to talk about tutors themselves. So you'll have anywhere between four to six tutors in your college and your college tutors are genuinely there for you. They care about you. And there will definitely be at least one person from your tutors who's going to be able to be your pastoral tutor. What that means is that their priority is also your well-being and making sure that you're okay. And that's quite important, especially at the university, obviously you're moving in there for the first time. So they genuinely care about you and they want you to flourish and do the best that you can. And I think that's something that really sort of like surprised me actually, was how much tutors genuinely care for you and will help you as well with all different aspects. So that's what I'd say in terms of tutors. They're from a huge range of different subjects. Each college will of course have different tutors. However, don't worry. Yes, some will have different specialties, but within each college, they'll have such a huge community and network within them that you don't need to worry about the minutia of what specialties does a certain college tutor have. They're all gonna be fantastic and they're all equally as good. And I think that's something that I need to stress. Okay, so the next thing is about, is it true that you guys have to write essays as Oxford medical students? The answer is yes, we do. You can be writing anywhere between one to four essays per week in a term time, which when I heard that as a prospective applicant was kind of intimidating because I studied maths, biology, chemistry, A-level, as most uh, prospective applicants do, you don't need to. So writing essays all of a sudden just seemed a bit crazy, just a bit not relevant because I was like, I wanna be a doctor, I don't wanna be a writer, I don't wanna be you know, a researcher necessarily. But actually, what I've realised is that there is no difference between thinking and writing. Writing allows you to structure your thoughts and that's a really important skill and being able to communicate yourself both verbally and also written articulation is so, so important. And that means that you're better able to express yourself and express your scientific ideas. And that's what Oxford's really good at. What I do also wanna say is that Oxford provides lots of support to help you with writing essays. I was terrible at writing essays, all right, in first year, as everyone is. But actually what ended up happening in the third year is that the paper that I got my highest mark in was my essay-based paper. So that just goes to show you what was once my greatest weakness had actually become one of my strengths. So you will be able to progress quite drastically throughout the time and you will get better at it. Everyone's in exactly the same boat as you and you will learn to write essays and it's such a crucial skill. In fact, you don't get to all the other medical schools. So having that opportunity to write essays is actually really good. So the next question I get asked is what is an intercalated degree? So at medicine, the medical degree is six years long, not five years. The reason being that the intercalated degree is compulsory. So the intercalated degree is an extra degree that you do on top of your baseline five years of medicine. So within Oxford, you have to do it within medical science. And when choosing your intercalated degree in terms of the different options that are available, so in Oxford you get to do a research project that you get to conduct and the medical school helps you in terms of finding different labs and supervisors and your college tutors will also help you with that, is that you actually feel like a kid in a candy store, right? Because you can do it on any topic within medical science and obviously Oxford is a research powerhouse, so there's an incredible amount of opportunities available world-leading labs that are available where you can actually do your research in. And that's been really, really cool. And that's a really good way of finding out, one, if research is for you, either as a full-time career, or maybe as something you wanna do in addition to being a doctor as well. So on that note, personally, for my intercalated degree, I did it all on molecular pathology, I did it on sleep, and I also did it on infection. So I was able to learn about cancer immunotherapy, personalized medicine for cancer, COVID-19, like pathophysiology, and also how you can treat it. And that was super, super cool. And during my time, they basically created this whole new module for coronavirus. And that was super cool to literally be able to speak to literally experts in their field and to be able to speak to people that were literally working on the COVID uh, vaccine, the Oxford COVID vaccine. And that was so awesome. And I remember those tutes so well. You learn so much for them and you really do find them quite fulfilling. Okay, so the next question is all about anatomy teaching. So at Oxford, uh, you're taught anatomy through prosection as opposed to dissection. 
So what prosection means is that the anatomy cadavers, as they're known as, so the bodies, are pre-prepared for you and they're usually done in sections. Actually, I don't think it's a big thing whether it's anatomy teaching in terms of prosection versus dissection. I think you're taught really well no matter what, especially as mentioned with the tutorial system, you're taught really well with anatomy. You've got e-learning as well, you've got flashcards that of course you can create, but I think the whole system in itself alongside lectures means you're able to learn anatomy quite well and none of my peers really have felt as if we're missing out on not having dissection. And actually, I feel like when you're still learning anatomy, you don't get to appreciate it otherwise if you're just sort of cutting into this body, into this bit of meat, not really understanding what's going on. So I think pro section allows the professor or whoever it is that's teaching to actually guide it through step by step. All right, so we've gone through all the questions about like why Oxbridge, and now we're gonna move on to the stereotypes and myth busting. A very common question I get asked is, is it true that everyone that studies at Oxford is a genius? The answer is no. The only thing that's common amongst all Oxford medical students is the fact that we're all passionate about our subject. It's that passion and that intellectual curiosity that unites us. Don't get me wrong. Yes, of course, there are people that are really, really smart, but it's not the fact that everyone here is a genius. I'm not a genius, but what's common is the fact that we all work hard and that we're all passionate about our subject. Actually, when I came here, it just struck me how basically down to earth everyone is and how just normal people are. And that takes us on to our next question, which is, is it true that there is no social life? And when I was applying and even when I got my offer, I was thinking, right, that's it. I'm waving my social life goodbye. You know, I'm just going to be slaving away in the library 24 seven. That is absolutely not true. You can get involved with as much or as little as you want. As I've said already, I've been involved with the African Caribbean Society, Islamic Society, powerlifting at university level. So you can get involved with as much or as little as you want, and it is what you make of it to be. Yes, you do need to manage your time effectively, and I live my whole life off of Google Calendar. And if you guys want to see me do a video on Google Calendar, let me know down in the comments below. And if we get enough likes, I'll be sure to do that. So the next question is all about settling in to Oxford University, what was it like? What was a step up like between year 13 and first year? I'm gonna keep it real with you guys. There is a step up between year 13 and first year of university, as there was between year 11 and year 12. GCSEs were a step up, A-levels were a step up, and university definitely will be a step up in terms of the breadth, the depth, the volume of knowledge. The thing to remember is that you don't ask for a lighter load. You, in that process, become stronger and more effective. That being said, firstly, everyone's in the same boat as you. Secondly, there's an incredible amount of support available, especially at Oxford University. You're considered as a person, you're not just a number, potentially at other medical schools when they've got so many other people in a lecture hall. It's very easy to just become an anonymous number and to be sort of forgotten, whereas Oxford, you won't be because you'll have those tutorials that will be able to go through anything that you don't quite understand. You've got your practicals, you've got your seminars, you've got all your tutors, you've got so much pastoral support available. So all in all, you're really well supported in settling in as well. I'm gonna confess to you guys that actually in second year, I was diagnosed with ADHD and it's something that I wasn't aware of before that had happened. And I can do a whole different video on my journey of having ADHD as a medical student. And actually I was then given additional support to help me um, in order to structure my essays in terms of study scores, tutoring, in terms of exam adjustments and other forms as well that I can talk about in a different video. And that was really useful and that actually helped me quite a lot. So again, it just uh, further reinforces my point that at Oxford, you're really considered as a person and they genuinely care for you. The next question I had is what do I love the most about the academic life? And it's probably the tutorials, right? It's that opportunity to have that intellectually stimulating discussion with an expert in their field and to get their thoughts on where they think the field's going through in the next 10, 20 years to have a look at the latest developments. And also when you're critiquing a paper, they'll give you, you know, an insight into their mind to how they think something through. And that's such a useful skill to develop because it now means that as a fifth year medical student, as I am now, when I um, interview or triage a patient, you know, take a history from a patient, you're able to really think like a scientist. You can think, oh, okay, what can be causing those symptoms? And you're able to break it down on what works on a molecular level, on a cellular level, on a tissue level, systems level, and how that could all translate in terms of these symptoms that a patient may have. So it allows you to think like a scientist. And I think that's what I've enjoyed the most. The next question is, what do I hate the most about academic life? Um, that is a juicy question, and I think hate is a very strong word. But if there's anything that I dislike, 
being honest, it's probably the volume of work that you're given as an Oxford medical student. But of course, that comes with the territory of one, being a medical student, and two, being an Oxford medical student. You do have a lot of work and you will be working harder than the average medical student. And the best advice is to not compare yourself to other medical students. You can, of course, still balance everything else, but it requires exactly that balance being self-disciplined, having that time management to go through. But it is something to really consider. And it, again, further reinforces the point of, do you really want to do medicine? Because if you do, you're going to find it more of a passion and you're going to enjoy it. What you don't want to do is go into medicine for the wrong reasons, waste a lot of your time of uh, your student loan debt and also the government and NHS money in subsidising your training as well. That's what you don't want to happen. So those would be my top tip. All right, so we're gonna go through application tips now. The question I get asked a lot just simply is like, how do I get into Oxford Medical School? Ultimately, there isn't one thing. You definitely wanna check out my medicine pass statement breakdown where I go through the selection criteria that they're looking for, how eight of the 11 uh, criteria, even at Oxford Medical School, are personal characteristics and how three of them are academic characteristics that they're looking for. In addition to that, what they also want to see is your intellectual curiosity and you can demonstrate that and feed that through extra reading. And that, in my eyes, comes in terms of on a either daily or weekly basis, checking out BBC Health, The Guardian. Um, personally, you've got podcasts, you've got YouTube videos, you've got books, you've got all of that available for you. You could do an EPQ. We've got all of these different ways in which you can demonstrate your extra reading, right? Personally, my best form I can do this is through YouTube videos. I love watching videos. I don't like reading books that much, actually. And I'd recommend subscribing to different scientific YouTube channels, including Kurzgesagt. They do some really, really great videos. We can show you some footage on screen and they do an absolutely fantastic job. So definitely subscribe to them. This is not sponsored in any way, but I think they're just fantastic and they do some really good videos. So getting into this habit of extra reading is going to be really useful to help give you that informed decision about what medicine is all about. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Aspiring Medics for more extra reading content as well. We go through book clubs where we go through different books as well as give you the top tips to help ace your application. We've also got our dedicated WhatsApp group. Link is in the description below. All right, back to the video. However, it's also worth noting that there isn't a hierarchy of different medical schools. Yes, there are different league tables and you want to be really clear on the different metrics that you're looking at. Are you looking at it in terms of research quality, of student satisfaction, the amount of income that they spend on per student? All of these things you can absolutely have a look at, but ultimately it's down for you to decide what the best medical school is going to be for you based on the different teaching styles and based on the different entry requirements that they have and taking that holistic approach. We've also got a table that I'll link down in the description below that will allow you to compare all the different UK medical schools. It's completely free. What I also want to say is that ultimately Oxford is not the end all and be all. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. If you do get it, great, but actually there isn't that hierarchy. In terms of my application, I applied to Oxford, Imperial, UCL, Birmingham. And being completely honest with you guys, my thinking was Oxford, I'm not gonna get it, but you know, in order to win the lottery, you've got to get a ticket, so you might as well. I went for Imperial, a nah, bit of stretching, but we'll see. UCL, yeah, happy medium, that's the balance one, that'll be good. And then Birmingham, I was like, right, yeah, that's in the bag. I actually got rejected from Imperial, UCL and Birmingham in that order before my Oxford interview. You can't let it get to you if you do face rejection, as we inevitably all will at some point, in some form, no matter in our life, all right? All you need to get is one offer to get into medicine. You only need that interview series to go well. That's all you need. And of course, fortunately, I was able to get my offer from Oxford and here I am now helping you guys to get into medical school. So that's my story to you guys. Never give up because if you do really wanna do medicine and you've definitely weighed it up and you've had a look at our playlist comparing all the different reasons to go into medicine, not go into medicine, you're making an informed decision, then go for it. I also get asked loads of other common questions such as how do I write my personal statement and if you haven't already heard of it look at our personal statement playlist including my video where I go through my personal statement in depth it's absolutely fantastic and an incredible resource that I'd highly recommend you use all right in terms of A levels the minimum um, offer is A star AA and it has to involve one of those being in chemistry you can do four A levels but in my personal opinion and this is only my personal opinion 
I don't see a purpose in doing four A-levels because why would you stretch yourself thin? Because if you get A star, A, B, and that's therefore not gonna meet the requirements. Even if you get A star, A, A, B, and that B is in chemistry, that wouldn't be meeting the minimum requirement either. So personally, I don't see the utility in doing four A-levels, but that's my own bit of opinion. Another question I get asked a lot is, should I do an EPQ? The answer to that is no, you don't have to do an EPQ. It's not within the Oxford Medicine Selection Criteria. Specifically, it is one way in which you can demonstrate your intellectual curiosity, but it's not the only way. We've mentioned podcasts, books, we've mentioned articles, and my top tip is be used to telling a story and to connecting dots together. So did you see something interesting in a care home where you paired up with a dementia care home resident, for example, and from that, that make you curious about the pathophysiology of dementia, Alzheimer's, for example, and how you can get a buildup of a particular protein and that can cause uh, cell death and that's what can cause the symptoms of uh, Alzheimer's, for example. And that did that then make you want to have a look at a video? Did you interview someone? Did you do a project? What did you do? So you can tell a story that admissions students aren't gonna be wow if you saw neurosurgery, unless you were able to talk about the effect of that, the reflection that you can have from that, but you can have that reflection just as equally from watching a YouTube video as opposed to watching neurosurgery. So it's all about how you can reflect and how you can make the most out of your situation. What about BMAT tips? So for this one, be sure to have a look at our BMAT YouTube playlist, where we go through section one, section two, section three. We've also got loads of past papers that you can have a look at on our website. So be sure to check them out. My top tip in a nutshell is practice, practice, practice. However, after a while, you will see diminishing returns. And once you see that actually you're plateauing and you're not progressing a lot, that means actually, you know what? That's the time really to do the BMAT. You don't need to worry too much about doing any extra preparation for it. Additionally, practice, but ensure that you're learning from every single one of your mistakes. Ensure that every single mistake you make is a lesson learned so that if you read the paper, you'd get a much higher percent, if not full marks on that paper. So that would be my top tip. Okay, another very common question I get asked is, how do I prepare for Oxford Medical School interviews? We're gonna have a whole new video series to help you guys out with that, including mock interviews, analyses and tips, and that's coming very, very soon in the pipeline. So stay tuned, be sure to subscribe to not miss out on those. In terms of answering the question directly, it's all about thinking out aloud. It's effectively a case of showing your working like you would in maths, right? So going from step A to B to C to D. So for example, how can a disease result in death? So what's happening in between and breaking it down either chronologically, for example, so step one, two, three, or can you break it down in terms of size? What's gonna be happening on a cellular level? What's gonna be happening a bit before then even on a molecular level, on a DNA level, cellular level? on a uh, systems level, and then also on therefore a patient level on a human body scale. So being able to think about that and scaling it or thinking about it in terms of time will be really useful. And ultimately giving down your thoughts and what they're really interested in, you'll hear this a lot, is seeing how you can think as opposed to what you know. So be sure to check our Oxford mock interview, which will give you further practice on that. What I'll also add for Oxford Medical School interviews is to be sure to brush up on your A-level biology and chemistry knowledge, particularly in terms of proteins, DNA, and also in terms of cell cycle, for example. All of those are gonna be really, really useful, as well as stuff like the heart and any physiology that you might have learned about in A-level biology. Make sure you're aware of that. And of course, everything from your personal statement is fair game for them to ask in interviews. And it could be asked as an icebreaker. It is very important that you do not lie in your personal statement because it has occurred when someone mentions a book and actually the author of that book is who they end up having in their medical school interviews at Oxford University. So be very careful. In addition to that, you want to also be ensuring that for every single line in your personal statement, you've got either two or three sentences that you can say if you were asked about that. So what did you learn during your time at your opticians, for example? That could come up as an introductory question as an icebreaker question. And in following all our tips that we've given, that will help you to hopefully get your offer from Oxford University for Medicine. We hope you guys have enjoyed this. We're gonna have loads more videos coming out on day in the lives that you guys can expect very, very soon. So be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any videos. Thanks so much for watching guys and we will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.